Welcome back. Um, this is uh, going to be part two of the, uh, I guess, compendium of our, I guess, my Nintendo collection. Um, see a little different parts in my room this time. Maybe it's a little more interesting to look at than it was last time. So uh, I think I got through about 50 games or so last time. I have 171 total, so I'm going to kind of go through these now. So, uh, kind of like I did last time, uh, I mentioned that some of these games are, are games that I have made them, and for whatever reason, it's part of my backlog, and at some point, I'll get to them. So, um, this was, uh, first of all, before I go any farther, um, I want to thank um, Chris at Classic Gaming Quarterly, uh, really for kind of inspiring me in a lot of ways. Um, one, to really try streaming. Um, I've done Let's Reads for hockey kind of things. And when I started, actually, when I first started watching Chris's uh, shows, um, as he'll always point out, I kind of got hooked when I watched the uh, NHL 94 um, video he made a while back. Um, it was around that same time that kind of a community was created. Uh, a lot of people might be like in the discord and whatnot and watching um, shout out to you guys out there. But um, I think when I started at that point, I probably only had about maybe 40 Nintendo games total. So it really in the last two and a half years, um, I've well over tripled the size of my collection. So um, it's kind of become kind of a, a big thing for me. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, while it's been expensive at times, um, I've enjoyed the journey, and um, I'm sure it's it's just the beginning. So, anyways, big shout out to Chris. So, uh, we'll start out with this one. This is uh, uh, Battle of Olympus by Broderbund. Um, I purchased this one at our local game shop here in, in Mauston, Wisconsin, where I live, at a place called Games for Us. Um, I've seen long plays of the game. I admittedly, I have not played it yet. Um, I kind of saw this on a recommendation by Friday Night Arcade, and it looked interesting to me. Kind of like Faxanadu, in a way. Kind of a similar action sort of platformer with some role, uh, RPG elements. Um, kind of an interesting game, and of course, it covers a little bit different uh, subject with, uh, of course, Greek mythology, and um, I'm curious to see uh, when I ever do get around to finally playing it, uh, how closely it follows, and I'm pretty sure they probably did. Broderbund was known pretty well for uh, getting the details right, as they were a, a computer software publisher before they jumped into the, the console market. Okay, uh, the next game... Uh, this was also one of those uh, weekend rentals. Um, Solar Jetman by Trey West. Um, this is a kind of a unique, uh, it's a bit of a space shooter. It's a bit of kind of a, a rescue style game where you have a spaceship, uh, a little kind of rocket pod, and from there you have certain tasks you need to carry out. It might be bringing back equipment with kind of like a, a primitive tractor beam, which you the more points you earn, you earn money, which then you use to upgrade your ship, which might make it uh, the engines more powerful because as you go to these different planets, they have different um, strengths of like gravity. And it has kind of a, a physics to it. Um, it's kind of similar to a, a Sega Genesis game, which I have, which is called Subterranea, um, where it's kind of a similar kind of thing where there's like a, a central base and you only have so much fuel and resources to complete your tasks and otherwise you lose thrust and you crash into the, the planet you're on and, and of course your, your ship will be destroyed and you lose a life. Um, it's kind of an interesting little game. Uh, you know, it, it can be frustrating because maybe you're, if, especially if you're on a planet where the gravity is maybe too strong for your ship, you really just have no chance to complete your mission. And that, that can be kind of 
demoralizing. But it is kind of a fun, challenging little game. Um, it's not just all about, you know, shooting other spaceships. It, it has that other, um, maybe a little more physics-related kind of element to it. So you, you have to have a little bit of skill, which I think is kind of cool that you don't always see um, in Nintendo games. Uh, this next game, I'll also give Friday Night Arcade a lot of credit for this one. But I will admit, I, I remember reading about this game in Nintendo Power Magazine, and that is uh, Hal's Kabuki Quantum Fighter. And uh, I remember reading about it because they talked about, of course, here's this uh, character that it's pri his primary weapon or his best weapon is his hair. And uh, as a person who loves uh, hockey hair, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that Kabuki Quantum Fighter has hockey hair like a mullet. Uh, like Yarmir Yager or something like that. But I always thought that was kind of a cool element. Um, but basically, to, without spoiling too much, you are kind of a government agent, and they recognize that there's going to be this terrible uh, disaster that's going to take place. So the government agent enters kind of a kind of a device where he ends up getting placed inside a computer, and he's fighting off, um, I guess kind of like the viruses um, and whatever the programming corruption that's going on in the computer. Um, it starts off, it, the game has a lot of, uh, of elements that are very similar to like if you played the original Batman game from Sunsaw, you're definitely going to feel like it's, wow, this game is very close to that. But it gets a lot harder and some of the levels are just downright cruel um, in terms of how uh, difficult they are, and it's really just platforming um, that makes it a real big challenge, but it is a fun one. It's very unique. Uh, if you can find a copy of it, I'd highly recommend it because it's definitely a different experience and um, kind of a cool and unique concept. I, I, I have a lot of fun with that one, and again, um, I learned more from Friday Night Arcade's short review of it and that kind of sold me that I needed to find that game and get it. So it's been well worth it. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite television shows uh, as a kid was Airwolf. I absolutely loved Airwolf. Uh, loved airplanes. And, and of course, uh, Airwolf was pretty much like uh, Knight Rider in the sky, more or less. And the Airwolf helicopter was just all kinds of badass. Um it was fast, uh, ridiculously fast. I mean, supposedly it could go past the speed of sound, which I think the laws of physics don't even allow you to do that, but we didn't know any better. Um, but the shows were pretty simple. <laughs> they were blowing all kinds of stuff up with the super secret helicopter, fighting off drug dealers, mercenaries, terrorists. I mean, it was it was doing all kinds of stuff all over the world. And uh, this game is absolutely awful. Um, while <laughs> it really tries in some ways to, you know, it, it has some cool intro sequences where it looks pretty cool. Um, as soon as you start playing the game, you realize just how terrible it is. Um, the helicopter is not simple and easy to control. Um, my, I just played this actually last week for the first time, and more or less you just, uh, it's kind of like Solar Jetman in the fact that you shoot some things, you shoot some targets, you know, whether it be aircraft, other helicopters, and then your your job is to rescue people, which in a way is kind of like the plot of the whole show. However, it's, the controls are so terrible that most of the time you just end up kind of crashing on it, you know, you end up just kind of falling out of the sky and wasting lives. And it almost kind of became comical. Uh, and, and from what I understand, the game doesn't really have an ending. It just kind of continues and you just keep doing the same thing, fly, shoot a couple things, land, pick up some hostages, bring them back. And, and that's all you do. That's pretty much the whole game. And, uh, yeah, they definitely mailed it in on that one, and it's it's really unfortunate because um, it, it was a cool show, and you know, unfortunately, the game doesn't nearly isn't nearly as great as the show was, and uh, 
In my opinion, that's a shame. I think that I think that was a, a missed opportunity. Um, narc, okay. Um, all part of uh, Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign. Uh, this was, of course, also an arcade port. Um, I remember playing this at the arcades. Um, don't ask me why, but apparently if you're uh, uh, part of this NARC uh, special police unit, um, <laughs> you wore either a bright red leather suit or a blue leather suit, and you wore your motorcycle helmet, even though you were driving a tricked out kind of super spy Porsche 911. Um, and you, I don't know why you needed to wear, have a, a racing helmet in there, but whatever. And uh, your job was to either arrest or kill uh, drug dealers. And of course you always got more points for busting them, but of course that meant you had to get close which is problematic, which means you're probably going to get more damage. Um, but you got a lot more money for busting people than you did just blowing them away, uh, either with your machine gun that you carried, your little submachine gun, or your grenade launcher, which was uh, always hysterical uh, when you blew people to bits. Um, <laughs> you weren't really looking for justice as much as you're exacting some kind of uh, uh, retribution on drug cartels, apparently. And there always was, for each level, some kind of profiled bad person, uh, whether it be like a demented clown that knifed people to death um, or some sort of a kind of military, uh, kind of like mercenary guy with like a big like M16 or something like that. Um, I also remember the uh, the other guys, the, the drug, the, the, the guys that threw like the giant syringes at you, which apparently were like the size of a, uh, like a five foot pipe, <laughs> which you'd think you'd just be killed. I mean, if you got touched by any of those, um, they certainly weeded your life down pretty bad if you got stuck with one of those things. Um, but anyways, uh, I had a lot of fun with this game. Uh, uh, this was, this was a fun one to play cause you could co-op with it. And, uh, I don't know it. I thought it was a fair arcade port. Mind you, it, you know, as the, as the action got more complicated, it tended to get a little bit glitchy. I uh, had a little bit of flashing here and there. Um, but still for like just mindless entertainment of, you know, just shooting and blowing things up. Um, NARC was a pretty good game, I thought, for, for Nintendo. I know some people think it's kind of stupid, but for myself, I mean, what what depth were you really hoping to find in it? I mean, this isn't this wasn't meant to be a Final Fantasy or a, a Legend of Zelda. It's it's basically a shoot 'em up and uh, that's, that's really all it is. So um, I had a lot of fun with this one and uh, this is one of those games I actually did uh, make sure um, I did not get rid of because I enjoyed playing it. So that's why I kept it. Oh, John Elway's quarterback. Um, I know Chris uh, at classic gaming quarterly talked about this one. Um, I played this, uh, on, uh, I played this on, uh, I've rented it a couple times and, uh, sorry about that. I'm, I'm posting this on Twitter that I'm streaming, but anyways, uh, I did, I, I, uh, any, anyway, sorry about that. I, I rented this game a couple times, uh, I don't know why I decided to do it. Maybe it was because. I had this thing, I guess, as a kid, I wanted to be different than other people. And, of course, the popular football game was Tech Mobile, which <laughs> it was well-deserved. But I didn't want to be that guy. I didn't want to be just a lemming, I guess, is the way I looked at it. And so I tried to find my own football video game um, um, for myself. And so I rented this one, and it seemed okay to me. Um, in retrospect, this game has not aged well at all. In fact, uh, <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, but the one thing I do remember um, when I was a kid, I'd have a, for my birthday, I would, I would hold like a, a video game tournament in, our, in my parents' basement. And the one thing I knew that my friends didn't know was that there was this secret play, uh, not really a secret play, but it was reverse. 
in the game where if you hit the right player, he ran about 10 times, he ran about three or four times faster than anybody else in the game and no one could catch him. And of course you'd throw it to that player and he'd just run around literally running circles around the other team while they looked like they were in slow motion. And of course that was tremendously hilarious the first time you did it. But after that, if anyone ever ran that play and did that, it got pretty annoying pretty quick. And that's kind of the way the game was really. I mean, after you did a couple of those little trick things, it kind of lost its entertainment value and pretty soon I wasn't playing it. But I did get this for my birthday. I want to say for my 12th birthday, I could be wrong. I was, uh, I, I'm pretty sure I remember getting it for my 12th birthday. I don't think it was very expensive. And this is a, this is a game you can find it just about any retro gaming store. They're, they're very available because it's cheap and it's not that great. So that's uh, John Elway's quarterback. I loved the Broncos as a kid. That was another reason why I liked it because uh, John Elway was one of my favorite players. Uh, another one. Uh, this is uh, Stanley and the search for Dr. Livingston by Culture Brain. Uh, this is actually kind of a rare game. Uh, I actually purchased this. Um, I have only played it a few times. I remember reading about it in Nintendo Power. It was not a featured game by any sense of the imagination, and you totally, if you played it, you can totally understand why. It's really just kind of strange. Um, it's based on the historical tale of a real search for Dr. Livingston in the wilds of South Central Africa. And I purchased this game for my history through video games class that never really took off. And uh, because it was, you know, it's a, it's an interesting event. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, it was a non-war related event and a lot of video history through video games was war related. So I wanted to find something that was a little bit different. And this was one of the titles that came up and I'm not sure how much history you'd learn out of this. It's more cartoony than probably getting any real history through it, but um, it was probably kind of an obscure story to really base a video game on anyways. And I don't think it probably sold too well. And Culture Brain didn't have many Nintendo games, I don't believe. And so um, it's a bit of a rare game, but it's not, I think it's like 30 bucks or something. Not particularly valuable, but um, I've only played it a couple times. It's kind of hard. It's a platformer. Okay, next. Um, actually, I'll start with the first one. Try not to screw this up like I did with Ninja Gaiden last time. So, real good game, in my opinion. Um, even though it's a bit dopey with its hitbox, is Wizards and Warriors Acclaim. And, uh, this was a game I played a lot. I remember playing at my cousin Casey's house a lot as a kid. Um, a game that's a platformer could be definitely very frustrating, especially when you're in those trees and you have to make those jumps just right. Otherwise, you end up falling all the way down to the bottom. And, of course, you die, um, which could really ruin a person's day. <laughs> um, but I did like the fact that it was fairly fast. Um, the, the music definitely gets kind of ground into your skull a little bit. And um, I remember more recently, at least uh, a couple years ago, I, I went back at this game and things that I thought were so hard as a kid, I suddenly was able to do them very easily now. And I literally got to the last boss and the game froze on me. <laughs> so I got all the way to the end. I probably was going to win and that was it. And I don't know. I haven't really gone back to it since. Uh, I, I like the game. Um, it, it was a good one, and it was definitely one that I know I rented as well. Um, and, and then eventually I got my own copy, but um, this was a this is another common one, but uh, a fun one in my book. Um, so much so, I ended up buying the sequel, uh, which of course is Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2, which is famous for having Fabio on the cover. And um, I bought that new at the time. And uh, with your game and your manual 
Uh, it also came with a full-size poster of effectively the front cover. So it was a big full-on picture of Fabio. And that was hanging up in my room for a number of years. <laughs> I, still, I still remember that time. Uh, I think it hung up in my room till I was maybe 15 or 16. <laughs> I just didn't have anything else to hang up, and I don't know. So one day... <laughs> Uh, I had a friend come over to my house. Uh, I think we were supposed to study for something, something for school. <laughs> and even though I knew at the time that you know, this was Fabio, this uh, Italian fashion model, um, I he, this guy walks, this kid walks in my room, and he goes, "What's Fabio doing on your wall, dude?" And immediately, of course. You become you become immensely like self conscious about it. Like, shut up, man. <laughs> and I think uh, after he left, I, I tore the I tore the the poster off my wall, and I, I think I threw it away because I was I was kind of ashamed that it was there, and I was afraid that he was gonna tell everybody that I had Fabio on my wall or something. But I don't know. I guess now you know I think about that. Like, why did I care? But you know, when you're a 16 year old kid or 15 year old kid and someone asks you why you have a, you know, a shirtless muscular man on your wall. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I guess the, the thought process was you were worried that they, they were thinking other things about you that you didn't want them to think. And I don't know, you were just more sensitive about that kind of stuff. Um, I should have said, so what, but I don't know. You're, you're, you're worried about, being accepted by your peers and whatnot. So I don't know, maybe you can laugh about it now, but I don't know, probably shouldn't have, probably shouldn't have let that get to me as much as it did back then. But the game pretty much is just like Wizards and Warriors. There's virtually no difference except for obviously the levels are a little bit different, but the overall gameplay is pretty much the same. Um, I know I got to like the ice level, I believe. I can't remember too much more beyond that, but I know I did have fun with it. Um, little known fact though, there was also a third one, Wizards and Warriors 3, um, I think it's what the, yeah, it's about Kuros, and, uh, this cover looks a little more intimidating, um, admittedly I have not played Wizards and Warriors 3, um, I think if I remember correctly, it's a little different than the first two, at least in terms of like what you do. Um, I know this is a bit of a, a later release game, um, but I have not played it yet. Uh, my copy's okay. It's not great, but um, I have to admit uh, until a couple years ago, I didn't even know they had a third um, rendition uh, iteration of the game that they made for the Nintendo. Okay, um, my last game out of this stack of games is Silkworm by American Sammy. Um, I picked this up at our local game store here in Boston, Games for Us. And uh, <laughs> this game, you have a choice of either being the Apache helicopter. Remember I talked about that uh, with our last batch of games. I talked about Twin Eagle, like how a lot of these games feature the Apache attack helicopter, which was kind of a, a kind of a, I guess you'd say kind of one of the few uh, American vehicles that kind of got widely celebrated for its actions during the, uh, the Gulf War of 1991. And uh, Silkworm, you can either be the, the Jeep on the ground or the helicopter in the air. Um, it's kind of a fun little game. Uh, pretty simple kind of shooter. Uh, side-scrolling shooter, um, and uh, I don't know. The the thing I will say, though, about this game is that uh, I'm really fortunate that this game is in as good a shape as, as it is. Um, the box that this came from came from, like, a, a guy who bought games in large lots, and uh, it was <laughs> my, the, the game store owner I'm, who I'm kind of close with kind of let me pick through the box before anybody else and 
the best way I can describe it is it kind of felt like being like on American Pickers if you watch that show, where you get a chance to really <laughs> dive through things in their natural state, which that means ugly and crusty. There was all kinds of nastiness <laughs> on these games that were in this box. Um, and luckily for me, this one was actually fairly clean. I mean, I definitely cleaned it up quite a bit from where it was, but some of the games were beyond gross, and I don't think they were even salvageable. Um, but this was one of the, I guess, gems of the box, and I knew um, it's not a real common game you see around too much, and uh, it's, it's a pretty fun one. And, of course, eventually American Sammy, uh, I believe, memory serves me correctly, they went on to buy Sega. Who would have knew that? That a company like a small company like American Sammy would end up buying Sega. So that's that stack of games. Okay, um, on to another one. So we'll start with this one. This is a non-licensed Nintendo game. This is a, a Comerica title. Maybe it works better this way, upside down. This is a uh, Quattro Sports. And uh, this is, I believe, made by Codemasters, which is out of, I want to say, Europe. And this game I purchased, um, and I have another one too. I purchased this one off of, I got my mom to purchase this off of QVC back in the day. Um, so they were advertising this game, and of course, you know, they were bragging about how, wow, you can have four games in one. And it comes with a baseball game. Uh, baseball stars, a soccer game, a tennis game, and uh, uh, which is called just pro tennis and BMX racing. And uh, the the baseball game is probably my favorite one out of the bunch on on this game. Uh, I thought it actually was a pretty decent baseball game, um, kind of fun. And then the tennis game wasn't was okay. Uh, I used to have my tennis players play that. I'm a, I'm a boys tennis coach, and uh, I used to have my players play that one. It's a bit rough. It's, it's not the easiest tennis game to play, but it's kind of fun, and it's still actually uh, I use a screenshot from it for my uh, participation award for those that don't letter. Um, but I don't know. It's a fun one. Soccer is horrible in this game. Don't even waste your time with it. And BMX is just okay at best. Okay at best. But kind of a interesting one. You can see mine's actually in pretty good shape. The, the gold is still holding up pretty good. It doesn't have, like, a bunch of black spots on it like my, like my uh, uh, Zelda games do. So I also got my mom to purchase this off of QVC. And this is also another Comerica Codemasters title. This is MiG-29 Soviet Fighter. Um, it's kind of a a third person perspective uh, air combat shooter. Um, maybe kind of similar to Top Gun, except for you're not looking at it from a cockpit view. You're it's like you're it's like you're a drone flying right behind your MiG-29, and uh, it's not too bad. Um, of course, it's 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 a MiG. 29, so um, the the bosses are often uh, Soviet planes you're going against. And um, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a cool game. I thought it was interesting just because, of course, the, the hero is not a Western fighter. It's a, a Soviet one, and I thought that was kind of cool. And I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a cool game. And again, it's held up pretty well. And uh, it's a game I never got rid of. So since we mentioned uh, that, those those planes, um, I have this one. This is a F-117 Stealth Fighter. That, of course, was a aircraft that we kind of really learned a lot about during the uh, Gulf War in 1991. And uh, this is a, a flight simulator, so you see it from a cockpit view, kind of like similar to Top Gun. Um, it's kind of a rare game. Uh, you don't see it too often. It's not particularly valuable, but... It is kind of a one you don't see as much. Um, admittedly, I've not played it yet. Um, Microprose did it. I've had some computer games with Microprose, so they probably did a pretty good job. Um, but yeah, that's 
you don't see too many flight simulators for, for Nintendo. Um, I'm sure it's probably pretty simple and basic just because of the, the nature of the system, but um, this was one of their more later uh, games. We already talked about uh, Pinbot, and so here's another uh, pinball one. This is uh, Trade West High Speed. You can see that Rare did this game. Um, and again, High Speed is a, a Williams pinball machine. Um, a friend of mine actually has this machine, and I will totally admit I'm not very good at that pinball machine, uh, but it is pretty fun. It's kind of like a, a late 1980s or uh, late 1980s machine. I'm not sure. I want to say I want to say High Speed was maybe 1988 as a pinball machine. So um, again, it's attempting to port a pinball game onto an NES game. Um, I haven't played this one yet, partly because, like I told you before, I'm not quite as good at this one. So if I'm not good at the pinball machine, I'm less apt to try to really sound like I'm too great of a player um, on it, on the NES. Uh, although maybe it'll help me uh, the next time I go to my friend's house uh, who has uh, my, my friend Aaron, um, who has high speed at his house. But Anyways, it's 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 a it's a classic pinball machine, and again, um, kind of melding both worlds. and And uh, I would imagine if it's anything like Pinbot, it's probably a a pretty fair attempt to replicate the same game onto the NES. But it's of course not going to be quite as the same. You're not going to have the the skill shot capability is really the thing that you lose the most from trying to play an NES game for a pinball or a pinball machine on an NES format. Okay. Um, what we got here? Oops. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next one is North and the South. This, I believe, is the only Civil War uh, Nintendo game that they made. And uh, while the, the cover art makes it look kind of goofy, um, especially with the purple and teal lettering, which kind of is a dead giveaway that it's early 90s when it was probably released, um, is that it's meant to be kind of a, a, a turn-based kind of strategy game. And uh, I had mentioned to you before that I'm a high school social studies teacher, and again, uh, I, that kind of interests me. This is kind of a rare game. You don't see them very often. Um, and I don't know, I have not played this one yet, but I have seen some overviews of it. And it, it looks like you either pick, you're going to either be the Confederacy or the, or the union. And, you know, your, your goal is to try to win the civil war. And uh, I don't know, it, to me, it's kind of unfortunate. They chose to make such a cartoony, um, kind of uh, cover art for what really is kind of meant to be kind of a serious game, you know, a, a serious strategy game. Okay, uh, next one is Arkanoid uh, by Taito. And uh, this, of course, is a simple, like, brick breaker type game. I used to see this one all the time at arcades. Um, in fact, uh, my, they teach a video intro to video game making class, um, through distance learning. And a lot of kids make some kind of similar brick breaking game. That's kind of like, you know, I always say, oh, that's, that's Arkanoid because that's what it was to me. Um, but pretty simple game. It actually had its own, uh, controller which I do not have. It it's almost looks like kind of like a, a Wii nunchuck kind of device, which it sits just in one hand and you have kind of a, kind of like a joystick, almost like what you see, um, kind of like what you see on like the N64. And that's kind of what it looked like. And I don't know if that would be easier to control for Arkanoid um, than using a normal NES controller or not. But this game is actually pretty rare for Nintendo, I guess. Um, 
through the the program that I use, which is called uh, Retro um, Retro Gaming uh, app on my phone. It's like an eight out of twelve, which for a simple game you wouldn't think it would be so rare. But my guess is probably it, it didn't. You know, it wasn't terribly exciting. I mean, it's pretty obvious what you're getting into. Um, and so the game was kind of an early release, and it didn't sell particularly well, probably. So I don't know, kind of an interesting fact that this game is actually rare when it seems so simple and basic for a Nintendo game. Okay, next one um, is Taxan's Eight Eyes. This is kind of a, an interesting, I think, game that's very similar to, like, Castlevania except for um, instead of a whip, you're armed with kind of a fairly short sword, which kind of sucks because you have to get pretty close to your enemies to, to get within range. But the thing that you're um, also armed with, or I guess you use in the game that's unique, is you use a falcon. And falconry, of course, is a big part of like the Middle Ages and also the Far East. And falconry, you have like this falcon that you can dispatch to go and try to take care of enemies from a greater distance, but you only have kind of a limited amount of control with the falcon, and that can make it kind of a, a pain. And uh, while I have not played it, I've seen people play it, and, and oftentimes they end up being very frustrated because, well, you know, there's enemies that they'd like to get rid of, the falcon doesn't seem to find them. Um, very quickly, and so you feel like part of it is just trying to get the falcon back and or get the falcon to do what you wish it to do, and instead of you know just getting in close and hacking it out that way, and so it's it's kind of a frustrating secondary uh, option that you have in the game, but it's definitely something that makes eight eyes unique. Um, and for some people, they find that to be kind of charming that you have this. I guess, secondary character that's always with you. Other people think it's terrible. Okay, next game. And uh, I have to admit, I get more people talking to me about this one whenever they, like, just kind of scope out my collection. Uh, of course, it doesn't hurt the fact that the title's huge on it, but it is a Wall Street Kid by Sofell. And uh, it's a pretty simple premise. Um, you're a kid that who gets this inheritance, and of course, you're now going to try to take that money and make more by investing in the stock market. And it's kind of interesting because they kind of try to make it like it's a comic book or a graphic novel with kind of the story that's kind of played through it. Um, I've never played it, but it looks kind of interesting to me, at least in terms of how it's done. You, you can do research just like you would for real stocks through the game like you can read like the the newspaper that is kind of like the storyline within the game and and try to give yourself a hint as to when to buy or sell and that's kind of how you play the game and as you get to certain thresholds you can purchase homes and other things and you're trying to of course get to a certain amount of cash as just the way to be successful i guess um Kind of an interesting concept. I'm, I'm curious why they thought kids would want to play it, but I guess everyone was maybe thinking, you know, for that kind of nerdy kid that, you know, he might be 13 years old, but he's thinking, of, you know, he's kind of like Alex P. Keaton from, the, from Family Ties where he's into politics and business and he doesn't care about the, you know, the, the more kid-like things that, you know, young boys are interested in. He wants to get involved and so... Maybe they were kind of trying to market themselves towards that kind of kid, that that the kid that had grown up early, so to speak. So, I don't know, interesting game and and uh, kind of striking. I need to get around to playing this one. I know, I know, Chris at Classic Gaming Quarterly said he liked playing this one when he had nothing to do. So, I don't know that it makes it sound like it could be kind of a fun little addictive game to play when you got nothing else to do. Okay, Clash at Demon Head by FCI, uh, or sorry, Vic Tokai. And, and um, 
this of course was the name of the I think the band from I can't remember the the movie with Michael Sarah in it. But anyways, Clash of Demon Head I heard is a precursor to I want to say Pokemon. I could be wrong. I'm probably, probably manga fans right now are screaming at me. Um, but the game is you're a guy, of course, trying to save his girlfriend from these these alien bosses in this world. And uh, you have kind of an overworld map. You choose your own direction. And as you destroy and kill things, you earn money, which you can use to upgrade your weapons, get special equipment. So like boots that allow you to jump higher or suits to allow you to go in the water or fly in the air. Um, the game can be kind of frustrating though because you kind of grind through levels um, kind of the same way you would have like with a fax Santa do where you end up kind of going back and forth, maybe in a place where like, you know, like the, the level scrolls to make enemies, you know, reappear and killing them and just to get money because you need it. That can get kind of tiring uh, to try to earn the money you need. Um, but it was a reasonable game. I got this for my birthday um, a lot, uh, when I, I think I was 13 years old, I remember getting it out of the big glass case at Toys R Us and, uh, I was so happy. And then for whatever reason, I got rid of it because I think I was frustrated with it, but then I eventually sighted at a retro store and, and picked it back up again. Um, and it's, it's kind of a cool game. Um, it's definitely one where, you know, you know, it's your, it's a game you're going to have to sit for a couple hours to beat. There are passwords, but you have to buy a little computer machine to get to get the passwords that you need to save it, which kind of sucks. So sometimes you end up spending lots of time just getting the money so you can buy one of those little password machines so you can finally just shut the game off and put it down and maybe come back at it in a couple of days. Okay, uh, next one is Werewolf. Um, this is a, a Data East game, kind of interesting, um, where you're a human being and eventually you will gain the ability to be a werewolf. And at times that makes you more powerful. Um, and other times it can actually be a hindrance. Um, I've seen some playthroughs for it and it's an interesting concept, which I had never I'd, I'd never heard of this game when I was a kid, and I never really heard anybody talk to me about it, but um, I'm su kind of surprised by that. But it's an action platformer. Uh, I've seen parts of it where it looks like it could get pretty frustrating, and um, I know towards the end it gets actually pretty darn difficult, but kind of interesting concept, and... I don't know, the, the box art's kind of cool where you see him like literally ripping himself apparently out of the game itself, trying to go trying to give you like a 3D effect. Um, which I think it looks kind of neat, kind of unique there. But uh you can see mine was a rental return or something, unfortunately. So it's got some crap on the on the actual sticker itself. I don't know if there's oh, there's nothing on the back, but oh well. Here's another weekend rental for me. This was Bandai's The Rocketeer based on the Disney, uh, based on the movie, um, which I really liked. Uh, the Rocketeer was kind of meant to be like a serial, uh, a serial hero from like the late 1930s, right along the eve of World War II. And um, I really loved the film. I thought the film was really good. Jennifer Connelly, woo! She looks smoking hot in that movie. But anyways, uh, you're the Rocketeer. You're basically this uh, guy who is flying uh, for kind of like an air circus for air races, which are really kind of the golden age of air races in the 1930s. And uh, you come across this uh, rocket pack, and you don't really know who it belongs to, but people, of course, want to hurt you trying to get to it. And he kind of realizes that these are some bad people, learns kind of the origins of what this rocket pack could mean because it's they're connect, It's connected to the Nazis and their plot to maybe secretly take over the world with all these rocket-packed 
soldiers. Um, and so your job, of course, is to, to mess those plans up. Um, the game's kind of fun. It's a challenging kind of action platformer. Some of the controls are a bit frustrating with it, but I do remember running this game a couple times. I kind of like the artwork in it. Um, but it, it was it was an okay game. It wasn't fantastic, but uh, I definitely enjoyed the movie, so it, that was definitely a big reason why I gave it a chance as a kid. So it, it was a weekend rental. Oh. I'll snack some stuff down. Okay, next is Deja Vu. This is a part of the McAdventure series. Um, this is the mystery, like, whodunit. Kind of meant to be like a 1930s um, detective story. And uh, admittedly, I'm saving this one. I have not played it. I definitely remember reading about this in Nintendo Power and thinking it was pretty cool. It's kind of a text adventure game, almost like the old school computer games. And um, I'm saving this one for me and my wife to play, uh, partly because it's a game where it's not based on finesse or you know, your ability to really handle a controller. It's, it's just working your way to solve problems, mostly with trial and error, or maybe, um, maybe with a little help from a guide or something. But um, my wife and I played another game, which I'll show you next, which is Shadowgate, kind of totally similar in, in uh, the overall format, but the story is obviously way different. So kind of a whodunit game. I've seen a walkthrough on this from Friday Night Arcade. I thought it looked great, and so I made sure I picked it up. Um, I did not pick up the other one, which is Uninvited, which looks awesome, but I'm sorry, I can't justify spending $80 on a, on a game like this, even if it is kind of gory. It's just not – I'll just stick with the two games I have. So there's Deja Vu. And the earlier game, which is what kind of started it all, and Chris – did a stream of this game, which I was most appreciative of, was Shadowgate, which of course now has been rebooted again. Um, and uh, Shadowgate was a lot of fun. I, I really wish I would have had this game as a kid. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing my brother and I would have loved to have played when we were kids. Um, but unfortunately, I just never picked it up. I do remember reading about it, but for whatever reason, I never saw it anywhere, which is I don't know how I missed it, but I did pick it up, and my wife and I played it, and this is the first game my wife ever beat. Um, I had a lot of fun just watching her complete a game, and uh, I have to admit that kind of got me back into a lot of things just because it's it's as much fun as it is to win yourself. It's more fun to actually watch somebody else win, and um, I, I think my wife enjoyed it a lot. So we're looking forward to doing the same thing with Deja Vu Hopefully sometime soon. So, but no, we did Shadow Gate already. Great game. Okay, speaking of licensed games, uh, Willow by Capcom. And uh, this was a movie I watched a ton as a kid, uh, which of course uh, stars Val Kimmer as Bad Vardigan. And uh, <laughs> kind of a, a fun action movie. Uh, George Lucas, I believe, was responsible for it um willow of course is the uh the dwarf uh person a wizard who is trying to bring the princess and uh rid evil from the land and bad bardican he kind of hangs out who's kind of a rogue um helps him out along the way along with some brownies and other people um and uh it's it's a challenging game it's 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 more like a role playing game, in terms of its style, which is a bit different. Um, I kind of thought it would be more like an action platformer, um, but it can actually be kind of frustrating. I played it played it once. Uh, I you know it was it was okay. It wasn't kind of what I was expecting. I guess I, I guess I thought it would be a little bit different, but um, Capcom normally doesn't take too many shortcuts, and uh, this one seemed like they kind of veered off a little bit, which is unusual for Capcom. Okay, this next one I just picked up just recently, and I played it for the first time. And again, this was another game I saw first on uh, Friday Night Arcade. Uh, this is Monster Party by Bandai. This game is 
freaking cool. I love this game. Um, I remember seeing it on Friday Night Arcade, and you know, he kind of talked about how incredibly gory this game is, and it definitely was made for. It was made kind of with the idea of little kids. You're the the, the main hero. You're a little kid, and it's kind of like you're waking up to fight all those monsters from your nightmares, and it is gory. There's blood and guts and all kinds of strangeness in this game. And uh, I, I don't want to spoil too much for anybody that tries to find this one, but please do yourself a favor. If you have not purchased this game, go and find it. It is freaking hilarious um, and fun. It's actually legitimately fun. Um, you meet this alien kind of dragon and he becomes a part of you. And at times you were, you will get a, uh, it looks kind of like a pill and you'll take the pill and then you'll transform from being your little kid self to being this little dragon that shoots fire. And, uh, and the little dragon can also fly, which is very helpful in a lot of different places. Um, but it's very fun and it's very unique there. They are not copying anything with this game. And I don't know. I, I, I think it's I think it's fun. I think it's I think it's really cool and creative. There's there's enemies in this game that would never be enemies on any other game you'll ever play. Um, and uh, I like I said I, I can't say enough good things about this one. This is definitely I think a must play and a must own for anybody that wants to play a fun platformer. Okay, next is. Swords and Serpents. Swords and Serpents, uh, kind of an RPG. <laughs> this uh, this cover looks like it could be like heavy, not quite Iron Maiden, but probably some hair band in the 1980s. Um, definitely has a lot of body parts showing, a lot of muscles showing too. And uh, I have not played this one yet. Um, I'm sure it's it's probably maybe a, a multi-party kind of game where maybe you control multiple characters and maybe it's more turn-based, but I don't know. The, the cover looked cool, so that's why I, I kind of purchased it. Um, I don't know. I'd love to hear more, so if you know more, uh, tell me more about it. At, uh, tweet me at Crease and Assist on Twitter um, or leave a comment at the bottom of the video to tell me more about it. But... I don't know. It's one of those games where I saw the cover. I thought it looked cool and, and I picked it up and I've just never played it. Okay. Uh, last one out of this stack is the last Starfighter. This is from Mindscape. And uh, this was a weekend rental for me. I rented this a couple of times. Uh, the film of course is about a kid who apparently gets discovered for his flying talent by playing an arcade game. And the uh, he gets met by an alien who more or less tells him, we need you to fight because the fate of the universe um, is in your hands and you're the best pilot. We know you've gone through all the training by playing this, uh, this computer game. And uh, even before he leaves Earth to go off on this adventure, he is nearly uh, killed by some aliens along the way who... Um, kind of like almost like Terminator. They kind of stalk him, and he makes his way to um, the, the base out in this far-off planet, and it's his one starfighter versus everybody else, as the the name implies. And uh, the, the movie used a lots of advanced kind of computer graphics, kind of similar, I think, to almost like Tron, um, which looked really cool back then. Now they look kind of funny to me. Um, but I remember thinking it was cool and, and the game's okay. Uh, I would not say it, it is as great as the movie. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was a, it was a, it was kind of a unique one. And I remember renting it, you know, cause I enjoyed the movie so much. And, um, later on I had a chance to, to pick it up just a couple months ago. And, and so I did, it's, I would say it's an average game at best, but again, a title you don't see too much. So, um, it's worth a little bit more just because it's, I don't think it had a big print run. Okay, so that's that. We're getting pretty close to an hour, so I'll probably shut it down fairly soon. Felix the Cat. 
Um, this is a late release Hudson Soft game. This one's actually fairly valuable. I think it's over 70 bucks uh, if you find one. Um, this is a game I read about in Nintendo Power as a kid. Um, couldn't find it anywhere. No one had it. Um, and I remember I really wanted to play it. It looked unique to me. I thought the Felix the Cat is, of course, a, a cartoon from the 1930s. And I kind of like the art style of it. And I thought it looked unique. And it's just kind of a simple platformer game. And uh, it's it's really fun. I enjoy it. Um, it's it's kind of a, I don't know, some people might even almost call it a cute em up with kind of the way the enemies are and the... The, the tone of the music, it's very happy um, and kind of, I, I don't know, kind of cutie, cute style, I guess. Um, but I enjoy it. And um, like I said, uh, later on, that was definitely a game that I kind of had circled that I wanted to pick up since I started collecting again. And, and I'm glad I got a copy. I've really enjoyed playing uh, Felix the Cat. So it's a Hudson Soft game. Which, of course, usually if it's Hudson Soft, it means it's pretty good. Okay, since we're talking about Hudson Soft, that's kind of our publisher that we're going to see now. Uh, a little bit rapid fire here. So it starts off, of course, with their classic platformer, uh, Adventure Island. This game's a ton of fun, too. Also, um, I don't know. I, I enjoy it a lot. It's kind of like an alternative version of like Super Mario Brothers, really, just with Higgins. And... Um, I don't know. It's it's one of my favorite ones. Um, I enjoy getting on the skateboard or, or whatnot. And I don't know. It's I wouldn't say it's the toughest game in the world to play, but um, it's kind of a fun one. And so I also have Adventure Island 2, a sequel. This one you also get to use uh, dinosaurs in it, which were pretty cool including like you can see the pterodactyl there for flying and, and other uh, almost kind of like a, a simple, like, like kind of a pterosaur like where it kind of almost looks like a triceratops, but only has two horns. You got those two. Um, and I also have the much more rare third edition of Adventure Island 3. Um, this too also is pretty expensive. It's about 70 or $80. And um, I don't know. I've enjoyed all these games. They're pretty cool. Hudson, Hudson Soft did a pretty good job on them. Okay. Um, here's another Hudson Soft game. This one's more of almost like a shooter. This is The Adventures of Dino Ricky. Um, kind of a weird one. It's kind of a vertically scrolling kind of shooter game. Um, kind of different. I've... I've seen more playthroughs of it. I've only played it once, um, but I liked it. It was, it was something unique. I don't know. It seems like a lot of the Hudson Soft games kind of had similar enemies, and I don't know. It seemed like kind of a certain obsession of theirs. Now, this is a game I've not played that's Hudson Soft. This is Mylon's Secret Castle. I think this is kind of a... A platforming game if I remember correctly um, but I have not played this one but like I said I was I was encouraged by the fact you know like I said Hudson soft typically makes pretty good stuff and um, it was a game I always read about I saw it's listed but I just never I never really had a chance to pick one up and I never really had a chance to rent it either but now I did now I do so I got it Okay, um, these next games are all like kind of like superhero games. So the first one here is Captain Planet and the Planeteers um, by Mindscape. And uh, Captain Planet, of course, was a cartoon from the late 80s, early 90s with the mulleted hero Pla Captain Planet who combined all these natural forces like earth, wind, fire, water, and heart. I think it was, um, to fight off polluters. And um, I don't know. <laughs> it was kind of a, a cheesy message to try to create more env environmental awareness. Um, but it's probably a message we could use. And unfortunately, we live in a day and age of 
no Saturday morning cartoons. And, uh, you know, I don't know whether it's me being sounding like an old cranky person, but I think we learned a lot of lessons from those kinds of things. Uh, I, I know people joke about like the old GI Joe PSAs or the Mr. T PSAs, um, on his uh, cartoon, but I don't know. I, I learned not to talk to strangers. My parents talked to me about it, but it didn't hurt having it, you know, having a reminder by the cartoons. I mean, we're young, impressionable people, and um, maybe that would help reaching those people if we had places to interact like that again. So I don't know. Even though it may seem cheesy today with his green mullet, maybe we could use Captain Moore, you know, or something like Captain Planet to reach kids today. Just a thought. Um, the game itself is not very good. <laughs> and unfortunately, I don't know if my copy works. Um, I, I've tried it, and it just goes to like a blue screen. I've cleaned it. I've taken it apart and cleaned it. Um, and I don't know. It's just not working. Uh, I really don't care to spend the money to try to fix it. Um, and so I guess I'm okay with it where it's at right now. Okay, uh, this next one unfortunately has a Blockbuster sticker on it. I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe someday that'll make it more valuable, but this is uh, Captain America and his Avengers. Uh, this is by Data East, and you can be a couple of the different Avengers. Um, I think the way the game, if I remember correctly when I played this, you pick two adventure, two different Avengers, and then you go through the levels. Uh, kind of similar to if you've ever played G.I. Joe, where you pick two different Joes and you go through the level. So you pick two different Avengers and you go through the game, and it's okay. Um, I don't know. It's a bit confusing at first. But this is supposedly the best one of the superhero games, probably in part because it wasn't made by LJN, which we're going to see with almost all the other Marvel, especially Marvel Universe games, where almost all of them were made by LJN, which did a terrible job, unfortunately. But I don't know. Captain America, I'll admit I never really had comic books, so um, I don't know. It, it wasn't something at the time that it probably attracted me very much because I wasn't really that interested in it. Of course, now superheroes are immensely popular. Um, this is probably the most valuable of the superhero games that I have, other than Swamp. I don't have Swamp Thing, sorry. Spoiler alert. Um, other than Swamp Thing, I have every superhero game you can have for the, for the Nintendo. And so this is the second most valuable, and this is The Punisher. I have not played this game, but imagining the fact that it's LJN, it's probably bad. Um, I'm sure there's a Cinemassacre on this, uh, Angry Video Game Nerd just loves to tee up on LJN games, and uh, rightfully so, because they most of them are pretty poorly done. They're just really just taking advantage of licensed property and hoping people buy it. Um, but I definitely need to get this one a try because I'm mean, going to guess it's probably more valuable in part probably because it's maybe the best one out of the bunch. Um, this one is terrible. I have played it. This is X-Men. The uncanny X-Men. And again, you can be multiple members of the X-Men, and it's bad. The controls are kind of like from a like top down, and the movement is very clunky. The action is clunky and awkward. And quite honestly, you really it's almost like you really don't know what you're supposed to be doing. And eventually your characters just get killed off and you have no idea what you were really supposed to be doing anyways. And that, that to me is all the signs of a, of a poor game. And again, taking advantage of a licensed property and throwing it into a mess of a game. That's mostly LJN for you, unfortunately. Um, Wolverine. Okay. Uh, Again, LJN, <laughs> uh, I have not given this game a spin yet either. I probably should. Maybe it'll be better because it's focused on just one person instead of everybody out of a group. 
Um, but at least it's a good, at least the copy's in good shape. This game I know is pretty good though. This is Konami's Batman Returns. This is a, a late release by Konami. Um, I have Batman Returns for Super Nintendo, and that's a pretty fun beat em up. But I do know that these games are unique. Uh, so Batman Returns for Super Nintendo is nothing like Batman Returns for the Nintendo. It's pretty much a, <coughs> a completely different game in style. So I have not played this one yet, but I'm but I'm sure it's it's probably actually not too bad. This is the most valuable of the Batman series. This is Batman Return of the Joker, which they also made, I believe, for the um, Sega Genesis as well. Um, this is pretty good. This is pretty much like the original Batman, but better, uh, an improved one. And Sunsoft does a fantastic job. Uh, it's interesting that Batman Returns was a Konami game. And Konami's a good publisher, don't get me wrong, but Sunsoft did... A great job on the first two and it seems weird that they would switch um if they didn't have to but um return of the joker was was a pretty fun one um it, it's a it's it's a really it's it's like i said it's like the first one but even better and here's the first one which i had and this was one of the few games i also kept um i did not get rid of this one because i had fun playing batman the video game <laughs> Uh, which was kind of based on the Batman movie that starred Michael Keaton and um, Jack Nicholson. Uh, pretty fun, even though the, the gameplay itself and the levels don't really match up to the movie. The cutscenes kind of do, but not the not like the the, the different uh, enemies and whatnot are really nothing like what you would have seen in in the Tim Burton. Uh, film of from 1989, which is probably a good thing because it probably would have looked pretty dopey. Because um, if you played Batman Returns for um, Super Nintendo, it it's definitely following the Tim Burton Batman Returns movie very closely, and it's it's like playing Edward Scissorhands slash Tim Burton movie type stuff. Okay, um, this is. Uh, Spider-Man and the Return of the Sinister Six. Um, I love Spider-Man. That's my favorite hero. Fortunately, this one's a little marked up because I think it was a rental game somewhere. But it's LJN, and uh, it's okay, but it's hard to tell. It, the controls are a bit difficult, and I don't know. I didn't get very far in it. I found it kind of frustrating, but it's it's an okay game. It's not like the X-Men, which is like almost, I would say, unplayable. This one's, you have a, it's it's tough. It's a little frustrating, but it's, it's actually you can do something in it. The Silver Surfer. Uh, this is by Arcadia, which had to be one of the more obscure publishers for Nintendo games. Um and kind of interesting that they did not put the Silver Surfer, Surfer on the cover art there, which seems kind of strange that they would just put Silver Surfer in letters. Um, the game's pretty tough. Uh, you have kind of a large hitbox, which is not fun when you're kind of side-scrolling and shooting as you do throughout most of the game. Um, but it is challenging. And uh, I don't know, it was a game I always wanted. I always heard about it. Didn't see it anywhere, and it was one that I made sure I, I got a hold of. And then lastly, <laughs> the worst game of the bunch, which is uh, Kemco's uh, Superman. And uh, this game is just about unplayable. It's not the worst Superman game. That, of course, goes to Superman 64. That is by far the worst ever. Um, but this one's up there. It's, it's not a real fun game to play. Superman is almost uncontrollable, just like he is in the N64 version. And uh, it's it's a terrible game. And, and, the, and the reason I would probably say maybe that's the reason for it, if you look at the actual uh, underneath the, the picture, which, of course, is like your classic uh, 
comic book is you can see that there's actually like several different publishers all fighting for the rights to put their name on this. And that tells me that it almost was like bureaucratic. So I'm sure that probably led to the development either being very delayed or kind of disjointed. And then that would kind of make sense that you had a terrible game because you had all these different entities involved and, and they weren't that great. So um, I think that's where I'm going to stop because it's, it's an hour and 10 minutes. I'm sure <laughs> this has been long enough for you. Um, I hope that uh, it's been, I got fun and um, I'll hopefully continue more with some more streaming tomorrow. Um, but for now, uh, have a good night and we'll see you next time.